meeting is uh, convened. Hello? Okay. Uh, so just <clears throat> the normal uh, announcements to get us all started. Uh, if you're here at the facility, if you need to use the restrooms, um, just please leave and they are down to your right all the way under the stairways. Uh, we need to have folks sign in on the attendance sheet, so if you haven't, um, please do that or raise your hand. We'll get the sheets to you. We are in a webinar this morning, and we are recording through that webinar, so it's important that anything you say uh, needs to be on a microphone or on the webinar. Uh, so if you're out there and you uh, want to talk or say something, press star 2. It'll unmute your line. And if you press star two again, it will mute your line. So uh, we will also accept public comments or questions um, by typing into the webinar. Uh, so you can do that, or you can just get our attention or raise your hand on the webinar. Please do um, state your title, your well, your name, title, and company um, if you have any comments. Uh, again, just a reminder for board members that we need to use our microphones for all discussion, motions, seconds, and votes. So just a reminder so we get that all on the public record. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, we'll start out by with uh, introductions. I'm Pat Melby, the chair of the board from Helena. Greg Gould, board counsel from Helena. Sheila Rice, board member from Great Falls. Amber Sunstead, board, me board member from Billings. Uh, Bruce Brenstall, executive director for the board. Johnny McCluskey, board member from Billings. Jeanette McKee, board member Hamilton. Staff, please. Oh, go ahead, Mina. Mina Chu, RBC. Ginger Fan. Ginger Fan Cook, board. John Wagner, QTAC Rock. Mary Palkovich, Montana Board of Housing. Vicki Bauer, Montana Board of Housing. Ashley Amato, Montana Board of Housing. Mary Bear, Montana Board of Housing. Andrea Davis with Homeward. Heather McMillan with Homeward. Leslie Torgerson, Board of Housing. Alex Burkhalter, Housing Solutions. Tyler Kearns, Housing Solutions. Uh, Greg Dunfield, GMD Development. Uh, thank you. Uh, those of, on, uh, of you on the webinar, please introduce yourself. Bruce, affiliated development. Oh, this is Liz Mogstead with, go ahead. This is Liz Mogstead with Rocky Mountain Development Council. Gene Lewer, GL Development, Helena and Helena. Eve Demick, GMD Development. Jennifer Wheeler, Glacier Bank. Ashley Graham, Ashley Graham, Montana Housing. So the last two of you, uh, please introduce yourselves again. You, were, you overrode one another. Okay, I'll go Charlie Brown, Montana Housing. Kelly Gorilla, Montana Board of Housing. Yeah, Kirk, are you on are you on the line, Kirk? I am, yes. Yeah. Okay, we, we got you now. And then Ashley, are you on the line? Yes, I am. All right, thank you. Uh, this is a time on our agenda where we accept public comment from any member of the public uh, on any matter that's not on the agenda, but it's within our jurisdiction. So do we have any public comment? Hearing none, we'll move on to the minutes of the August 8 meeting and um, <clears throat> determine whether we want to adopt those minutes. Mr. Chair. 
I would move yes. adop- I would move adoption of the prior board meeting minutes as sent out and in our packet. Do we have a second? This is Johnny, I will second. Thank you. Is there any uh board discussion or questions on the August eighth minutes? Are there any public comment or questions on regarding those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of uh, approving the August 8th minutes signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. We're moving on to the home ownership <laughs> program. Vicki, that would be you. Can you hear me? Good morning. The first item on the homeownership agenda is for the approval of a bond resolution um, for number 180911SF03-2018C. Um, the attached, the resolution which is attached um, to your board packet approves the issuance of a fixed or variable rate mortgage revenue bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $75 million. Um, and it can be used to finance both new loans or uh, refund bonds previously issued for such a purpose or both. The resolution is written to give us the flexibility to issue bonds under any of the three indentures and to refund bonds from any of the three indentures. The difference between um, this resolution and the standard resolution that have been proved approved for previous issues is that this resolution allows for a float, floating rate note as a variable rate option and it includes the authority to enter into a standby bond purchase or liquidity agreement and remarketing agreement in case it's needed. Um, we intend to issue bonds under the single family two indenture to purchase new money mortgages at a fixed rate which is currently set at four percent. As of August 31st, we had just over $5.6 million left to reserve in the 2018B issue, which was closed in August. Um, and this resolution will allow us to move forward with a new bond issue this fall once the 2018B funds are um, fully reserved. Staff requests the board approve the attached resolution. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, are, the, are there any uh, comments or questions, discussion from the board? Mr. Chair, um, John or Vicki, um, is the resolution limit the percentage of bonds that can be uh, sold at the floating rate? I don't believe it does, no. And if you could explain the board oversight, uh, this becomes a staff. Uh, process, but I think uh, uh, the chair might have some authority there. So if you could explain that, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is John Wagner. Uh, the resolution specifically provides in Section 3 where it authorizes the issuance of the bonds that uh, the bond issue and all the terms of the bonds have to be approved uh, by the chairman and the executive director uh, with the advice of the members, such members of the board as are, as are determined by the chairman uh, to be appropriate. So the chair has an absolute veto right with respect to any pricing in the structure of the bond issue, and the chair also has the right to talk to any board members or get their advice on what they think is appropriate. So there is absolute control on the part of the board over the staff's decisions. It's got to be a, a thing that they agree on together. Does that answer your question? And, and I think as chair, I don't think I would do anything without having this run by the board. So, uh, you know, the, well, this is Bruce, and I, and I just and I just kind of wanted to, you know, put on the record. I think what at least I am, and I think staff is kind of thinking here is, um, you know, th- this will give us the flexibility to kind of dip our toes in the water as far as variable rate goes, but. I'm kind of a modest guy and I, I don't, we want to do this very modestly. So, um, you know, if we do this and if the numbers all align and it makes sense and the structure of the bond deal makes sense, uh, we may, you know, propose trying this 
Um, and we'll let, of course, like Pat says, we'll we'll uh, notify the board so everyone's in the loop. But you know, my intention is to try it at a very very modest level, maybe 10% of the deal at max. So just just to put that on the record. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, are there any comments or questions from members of the public regarding uh, the adoption of this resolution? Uh, hearing none, the board would entertain a uh, motion and a second to adopt the resolution. I move to adopt uh, the proposed resolution. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, there's no further discussion from the board. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> all opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion carries. Vicki, you can move on to the next item. All right. <clears throat> the next item I have is an update of the co-signer policy. Currently, the board's policy for a co-signer is that they qualify under the following definition found in the purchasing and servicing guide. That a co-signer shall mean a person secondarily liable for repayment of the borrowed funds. The co-signer is generally to be a non-occupant co-signer and will not be on title to the residence. The co-signer's income, assets, liability, credit history are considered only for the determining the credit worthiness of the mortgage loan. The occupying borrower must have sufficient income to make, pay, make the payments. While the co-signer does not hold ownership interest in the residence, it is still liable for repaying the obligation and must sign all loan documents with the exception of the trust indenture and the board affidavits. A transfer of title to the co-signer after the loan closing is a violation of the board's program requirements and is not allowed. The current policy is not specific enough and it often causes questions from lenders. Um, so staff polled other HFAs with regard to their policies on co-signers and we propose that the board approve the following clarification, clarifying changes to the definition of the policy. And it, it really comes down to the sentence in the middle that um, speaks to the co-signer will be allowed for credit purposes only, meaning the occupying borrower has income to qualify per the insurer's DTI requirements, as opposed to just being able to make the, the mortgage payment. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, are there questions or discussion from members of the board? Vicki, this is Johnny. Have you run into multiple issues with with regard to why you have to clarify this? Yeah, it, it's just often confusing for the lenders. And we had one loan come in with a co-signer and we don't underwrite the loans internally, but um, when we reviewed the underwriting, the ratios were much higher than we would have liked to see them. Um, and they're, um, I don't believe they they truly met the um, underwriting guidelines, um, but the, it appeared that the borrower could make the payment. Their income was more than what the mortgage payment was, so I would really like to have clarification that it has to meet the DTI requirements and not just say that that borrower has more you know enough income. I mean, if they make a thousand bucks and their payment seven hundred and fifty, you know, on paper it looks like they have enough money to make the payment. And so it's to avoid that kind of a conversation to have to have with the lender, it's just more specific without actually listing a number because depending on the um, compensating factors in underwriting, you know, the DTI can be um, a little bit higher or lower. Thank you. Is there further discussion or questions from members of the board? Are there questions or comments from members of the public? Chair, we'd entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Okay, if there is no further discussion from the board, uh, all those in, in favor of adopting the cosigner policy signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries.
So the next item um, for consideration of the board's approval is an increase in our lender fees. Um, since January 2017, the Board of Housing has allowed lender compensation in an amount of 2.75% in our loan programs. We purchase loans at 101% and pay a 75 basis point service release premium, and then the lenders can collect up to 1% to of the um, collect up to 1% origination fee from the borrowers to keep costs down to our borrowers, lender fees such as application, administration, underwriting fees, processing fees, and document prep fees cannot exceed a total of $500. Um, staff received a written request from Jason Mann with Mann Mortgage um, in which he requested that they be able to um, charge the borrowers a 2% origination fee um, and his reasons are stated there. Um, it has to do with covering the cost of how they process our mortgages through their origination. Um, we did survey other lenders and we kind of got mixed responses, some stating that our current compensation is enough and others stating that our compensation does not cover the cost of, a loan, of the loan. Um, staff requests that the board approve an increase in lender compensation, allowing the lender to charge 1.7% Five, one and three quarter percent origination fee, which will have a net effect of zero on the mortgage yield calculation in our bond issuance. And then also we request that they remove the $500 cap and allow the lenders to charge what is usual and customary um, on the underwriting and application and other fees in the loan. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, is there discussion uh, from members of the board? Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a question for Vicki. So Vicki, uh, my concern about usual and customary would be who makes that decision. And I just want you to explain why you propose that instead of just raising it to 750 or something like that. Um, I think that our fear is that um, just 750, it, it's going to end up not being enough and we're going to end up in the same conversation again. The um, we do have MCC files, mortgage credit certificate files, and those are files that come to us where we issue a mortgage credit certificate, but we don't actually purchase the loan. And we do see differences in the fees that are charged to bar other borrowers the lender works with when they're selling to a different market. And so um, the usual, we can kind of keep an eye on usual and customary in that respect to know um, whether or not they're overcharging the borrowers in our programs. Um, and we just felt that not identifying a specific and allowing for usual and customary um, would be the way to go. Um, is another, is a goal f for the Board of Housing to increase lender participation by doing this? It really is. Um, over the 18 years that I've worked for the board, um, w there's always been about a 2% um, limit on the fees that can be charged to the borrower through the origination process. Um, since 2008, when the housing market bust, um, there has been increased compliance requirements placed on the lenders. Um, there's a lot of extra disclosures that need to be done. In some cases, whole departments have been established to um, fulfill the requirements. And so the cost of originating loans has increased. And so um, we're proposing that the, uh, their compensation on a board loan to keep them participating. We have heard from lenders, some lenders, that they don't participate in the board's program at all because we don't allow them to earn enough income and it, it just doesn't work for them. Yeah, just to, and one quick follow-up question, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, how will this affect our borrowers? Um, of course, it'll increase the um, um, the cost of getting a loan, um, hopefully not significantly. When we allow them a limit, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the lenders will charge, you know, that full amount. Um, but it, there will be some increased cost in. Of course, that would be over a 30-year period. Correct. <laughs> The further discussion from the board, Bruce. So, um, just something for the record again. To you know, I think it also will allow more borrowers access to our programs, which is a good thing. 
um, in the fact that I believe that because we service those borrowers, we're able to provide a high quality, not, not that all services are bad, don't get me wrong, <clears throat> it's just that I believe we do a pretty good job and I think that's also a really good benefit. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion or questions from uh, members of the public? And I include those people on the webinar. I know I'm a little quick here sometimes and moving on to the motion. Mr. Chairman, just, just one point of clarification. Uh, it says that you will give you uh, an ability to consider an increase. Are you, is that specific enough um, for what you're going to do? Actually, my request, um, after reconsidering and determining what um, would work best for our programs, um, staff requests the board approve an increase in lender compensation, allowing the lender to charge 1.75 origination fee and um, removing the cap, the $500 cap on the fees and allowing them to charge what's reasonable and customary. All right, thank you for that clarification. I was going to ask for that before we had a motion. So hearing that, um, board, we have uh, a request to increase the origination fee to 1.75, uh, eliminate the cap of $500. Is it reasonable and customary or usual and customary? Uh, usual and customary. All right, thank you. So chair would entertain a motion. So moved. Okay. Um, if there's no further discussion from members of the board, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. The next item on the agenda is the approval of non-insured community land trust loans. A community land trust is a nonprofit community-based organization that works to provide perpetual affordability, affordable home ownership opportunities. In the truest sense, a CLT acquires the land and removes it from the for-profit real estate market. CLTs hold the lands they own in trust forever for the benefit of the community by ensuring that it will always remain affordable for the home buyer. CLTs provide long-term affordable housing by owning the land of a property but selling the home on the land to an income qualifying borrower. The homeowner then leases the land from the CLT through a renewable ground lease. The ground lease connects the homeowner to the community and to the and to keeping the house permanently affordable by including a resale formula that determines the home's CLT sale price and the homeownership share of the home's increased value at the time of the sale. Montana Board of Housing has purchased loans on CLT properties in the past in both the regular bond program and through approved set-asides. It has always been required that these loans be insured, usually with FHA or RD. Sandy May has an option to remove mortgage insurance for CLT mortgages because the value in the subsidized property greater than 20% of fee simple value so that the loans end up having a loan to value of less than 80%. They allow the use of the appraised value rather than purchase price to determine the loan to value, which could mean the borrower has 20% equity built into the purchase. This reduces the borrower's payment and is a great option if they can qualify for a conventional mortgage. It has been requested to the board to adopt a similar policy and waive the need for mortgage insurance on loans for CLT properties if the loan to value of less than 80% can be established. Staff requests that the board approve a policy for community land trust properties that if the loan to value of the property is less than 80% because of the subsidy built into the purchase by the community land trust that the mortgage requirement be waived. Thank you. Uh are there questions or discussion from members of the board? Mr. Chair, um, I first want to state that I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Trust Montana, which is a statewide uh, land trust and uh, supportive agency for all land trusts in Montana. Um, I'm, I'm going to vote in favor of this. I think it's a really important consideration as we see um, 
a huge recovery in housing prices since the uh, 2008 uh, mortgage crisis, we really see that land trusts are increasingly the most feasible way not only to create affordability, but maintain affordability literally over the lifetime of the home. So I encourage the other board members to, <clears throat> um, to support this resolution. Thank you, Sheila. Are there further questions or comments from members of the board? Do we have uh, comments or questions from members of the public? Hearing none, uh, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I would adopt the <clears throat> staff. I would move that we adopt the staff proposal on this board agenda item. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, if there is no further discussion from members of the board, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving right. Um, my next agenda item is a set aside approval for Lee Gordon Place. Um, Bob Oaks is requesting a set aside for $1,045,000 for North Missoula Community Development Corporation um, for seven townhomes in downtown Missoula that will be available to households under 80% of area median income. They will be shared equity community land trust homes and are getting home funds from the city and state and CDBG funds from the city. They're interested in an opportunity to avoid FHA insurance requirements because of the inherent value in the subsidized property. Um, the seven townhomes are under construction the, and are partially funded with a combination of city and state administered HUD funding. The project has also received funding from the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and the city administered EPA Brownfield funds used for deconstruction of asbestos and asbestos and abatement of the vacant city Retag department building previously on the site. The Montana Department of Quality, um, Orphan Environmental Car, sorry. Um, orphan Share Fund with some soil removal. The construction loan is being provided by First Interstate Bank and Stockman Bank. The townhomes will constitute five two-bedroom units priced at $145,000 and two four-bedroom units priced at $160,000. One of the two-bedroom homes will be a single story and fully ADA accessible. The remainder will be three-story with ground floor house parking and living space above. The project is located on Front Street in downtown Heart of Missoula neighborhood. The property was donated to NMCDC by Stephen Lindsay Dub, who inherited it from their uncle. The homes at the Lee Garden Lee Gordon Place will be shared equity and remain permanently affordable through the lease restrictions. This will be the first permanently affordable home ownership project in the city core, several blocks away from there. There are new town homes under construction that are marketed at five hundred and ninety thousand dollars each. Staff requests that the board approve this set aside of $1,045,000 to finance these seven townhomes, allowing them to be financed without FHA insurance if the, appraised, uh, if the appraisal supports a loan to value of less than 80%. The set aside would be funded out of the single family one combined revenue funds. And um, I did update this at a rate of 3.5, which benefits the borrower with a rate that's lower than the regular rate. The funds are available and the land trusts are an important tool for providing affordable um, housing in high cost areas. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, are there questions or discussion from members of the board? This is Johnny. I just want to put it on record that I work for First Interstate. So when we vote on this. Chair, I'm, I'm going to vote for this and the next resolution because I, again, think land trusts are really an important part of how we create and maintain affordability in our for sale homes. 
But I want to encourage the staff for the next meeting or a future meeting to uh, think about creating a set aside similar to the habitat set aside where all of the habitat affiliates have access to a common pool of money rather than approving these one off. I think it's fine today, but I just want to uh, encourage staff to bring us back a, a set aside for all land trust acquisitions. Thank you, Sheila. Good comment. The further discussion from members of the board? Are there questions or comments uh, from members of the public? Okay, the board would entertain a motion to approve uh, the staff recommendation, I guess with the change that the uh, term of the financing would be 3.5% rather than 3.125. Uh, I will so move. Second. Okay. If there is no further discussion, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing no opposition, the motion passes. All right. And I think I'm down to my last one. Um, it is for another set-aside approval for Montana Street Homes. Andrea Davis is requesting a set-aside for a million dollars for Homeward and Trust Montana for pre for six pre-manufactured homes in Missoula that will be available to households under 80% uh, percent AMI. They will be shared equity community land trust homes. The history of the homes is 50 homes were built in Indiana in May 2013. They were transported to Sydney, Montana for Bakken oil fields, but never placed. They were purchased by HRDC in Bozeman in October of 2016. 10 of those homes were sold to Homeward in March of 2017. They were transported to Missoula directly from Sydney and stored securely at the wastewater treatment facility to be placed on permanent foundations with crawl spaces in December of 2018, these, these six of the 10. Comply, um, they comply with the Montana building codes and at the time of, cons they complied with the Montana building codes at the time of construction. Um, that's the 2009 International Residential Code. It has been determined that these homes can it has not been determined that these homes can qualify for FHA insurance or other secondary financing. Fannie Mae is considering issuing a variance specifically for these six units and some local banks have considered carrying them in-house as portfolio loans. Providing financing for this project would be a purely mission-based decision as future financing of these homes would probably also be provided by the board. The homes consist of five two-bedroom units and one one-bedroom unit. In order to qualify to purchase homes at Montana Street, the buyers must be able to secure a loan without a co-signer, earn no more than 80% of Missoula's area median income, fulfill the home and lender underwriting requirements to ensure that the borrower has sufficient income to secure a loan responsibly, attend a HUD certified home ownership class before closing, and sign a 75-year ground lease with a lender writer, a Montana Board of Housing writer. Staff requests that the board staff requests the board to approve this set aside for a million dollars to finance these six homes, allowing them to be financed without mortgage insurance if the appraisal supports a loan to value of less than 80%. This set aside would be funded with single family one combined revenue funds at a rate of 3.5. Funds are available and land trusts are an important tool to providing affordable housing in high cost areas. Thank you. Uh, are there questions or discussion from members of the board? Mr. Chair, <clears throat> a question for Vicki. So Vicki, turning this page led me to the Home Ownership Program dashboard. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the balance in the set aside cumulatively. I just want to uh, see if I'm reading this right. It, I think it says 3.65 um, million. Mm -hmm. So we just allocated two more million, a little over, that brings it down to about 1.6. So I just want to have you explain to me how we know that there's enough money for set aside. So um, the way what this dashboard reflects is what's remaining of the set aside approval that was issued in 
we had we've had two of them. We had one request in um, November of 2017 and then there was another request I believe it was June of 2018 and so the total amount of set aside funds and that was allocated specifically to a lender pool and that lender pool consists of um, the Home Start program, the NHS uh, down payment assistance loans, Dream Makers, um, CAP, HUD-184 loans. So there's a, um, a, a select um, uh, types of loans that are dedicated to that set aside and with that set aside those loans are all required to be insured and they're funded with pre almond funds with these set asides that we were requested today they're going to come out of the combined revenue um, funds and the reason being is because the pre almond funds, they have to be insured, or at least in the single family two indenture where we're currently funding the loans from, have to be government insured. And so it comes down to the different pots of money. So these two set asides will actually be separate from the set aside indicated on the dashboard. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, are there further questions or discussion from the board? Are there questions or comments from members of the public? Hi. Uh, good morning, Andrea Davis with Homeward. And at risk of being repetitive um, for Vicki's presentation and the board report, I just wanted to further emphasize that the set aside, um, if approved by the board today, would further offer home buyers opportunity for basically shopping a mortgage. And so we we believe very much that this would be uh, the most advantageous financing that these home buyers could access. And uh, we're also concerned about next generation buyers. And so as, as Vicki uh, mentioned, that this being a very um, mission-oriented product produced by the board, um, we very much appreciate it. We are pursuing as many options as possible, however, and so we, as Vicki mentioned, we're working with um, Fannie Mae to work with a couple of local lenders to get a, a variance in place. Those variances often are contractual in basis, and so they need to be renewed occasionally, and that might not necessarily be a standing variance that lasts for the period of affordability of this project. So the Board of Housing set aside would be very important um, to have in place. In addition, we're also working with local lenders who are interested in potentially keeping some of these mortgages on um, their portfolio as a portfolio product. And um, we have two local lenders that are interested, but we don't have any firm commitments yet. And so even if they do keep some of these loans um, on their portfolio, they would not be at the advantageous rate of 3.5%. So we do believe that homeowners would likely select the Montana Board of Housing set-aside funds. Um, but that, of course, is completely optional, and we wouldn't steer homeowners to any particular product, just making sure that they know what their options are. And so this is a very advantageous and affordable option for this particular product. And I just wanted to also let you know that we're here for any questions you might have, because it's kind of a strange little nuanced project. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Drea. Are there further uh, comments or questions, discussion from members of the public? Andrea, this is Johnny. What happened to the other four units? The other four units are still in storage, and we have not selected a project for those yet. Um, the challenge being is finding a lot, um, an actual parcel of land to, to place these units. So currently they're uh, continuing to be in storage. We've been in partnership with the city of Missoula. They were very eager for us to acquire these units and place them in, in the city. And we have an interest list of about 75 individuals. Some of those individuals want to take these units and place them on their summer property on Flathead Lake. So not everybody's interested in affordability. Um, but so we're working through that interest list to make sure that we're finding income qualified households. But uh, the other four are yet to be determined in terms of what we'll, what we'll do with those. We may place those into a similar project that we're doing with this. We may uh, sell those um, on the open market potentially to income qualified individuals. The Board of Homeward and the staff are examining the best approach right now. Thank you. you bet. Thank you. Uh, are there further comments or discussion from the board or from the members of the public? Uh, if there's no further discussion, then the chair would entertain a motion 
to adopt uh, the staff's recommendation with the uh, understanding that the rate would be at 3.5 percent. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve this. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt uh, this proposal with an interest rate of 3.5 percent. Uh, there's no further discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same uh, sign. Motion carries. Mr. Chair, I have a question relating to these last two motions. Um, we we give the staff the ability to set the set aside rate, and we put in both of these motions it was 3.5 percent. And I wonder if we've taken some flexibility away with just that action inadvertently. Um, taken some flexibility away. Well. So this set aside is at 3.5%. What if staff decides that the set aside rate in general should be 3.6%? Oh, um. well, I would suggest at this point, uh, as we've adopted these motions, if that happens, you'll have to come back to the board to get that For change. It. Okay. Um, yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, in in the prior motion related to the Lee Gordon place, the the wording in in the packet materials says at the set aside rate available at the time of financing currently 3.125% and I I understood Vicky to say maybe that's currently not 3.5% but I, I don't know if that was intended to be flexible to follow the the adjustments in that rate or if the board is intending to specifically require that it be at 3.5%. Uh, it was my request that it be at 3.5%. Um, and part of that is um, the without the insurance, we have a, a, um, a level of a slight level of risk in there. And so having a little bit higher rate um, on those set asides of three and a half percent instead of the three and an eighth percent. Just to clarify, specifically, we do want it at 3.5 percent. The staff will have to come back to the board if they want to change the interest rate on these two set asides. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good question, Sheila. And thank you, Greg, for pointing out that that was <laughs> just a uh, mention of what the current interest rate was. However, it is now set at 3.5 percent for both these projects. Mm -hmm. All right, Vicki, want to go ahead and. Um, yeah, the final item in the board packet is the homeownership dashboard. Um, as you can see, for the reservations that we received in August, um, it was very busy, um, and actually all summer was busy. We had good production, good interest in the board programs. I believe the DPA products that we have available out there in the communities um, has really assisted in keeping our programs moving forward. Um, the, we had the 2018A bond issue. Um, it was uh, closed at the end of April, and at that point in time, on the day that it closed, we actually ran out of money. And then with the 2018B issue, um, which we just closed in August, like I said, um, with the numbers that we had at the end of August, we had about $5.6 million left, and we had started that issue at – $30 million, and by before, by when it was all said and done, we issued $50 million. So the production, board production has continued to um, grow over the summer, and we hope to see that, especially with the adjustments that we've made in the loan program today. Um, you can see the changes in the July portfolio. Those were the um, amortized numbers when I prepared the dashboard, and so you can see the the changes in the portfolio numbers, as well as the delinquency numbers um, there on the dashboard as well. We continue to see improvements in our delinquency numbers. I think that's attributed to um, the economy, but as well also to the quality of servicing that the borrowers are receiving um, by Mary and her team. And so if you have any questions, um, with regard to the dashboard and the numbers presented there, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm done. Mr. Chair, a question for Vicki. Vicki, I'm focusing on the Veterans Loan Program Yes. under other programs, and I note that it says revolving in the balance, but we are capped in terms of the amount of 
funds that we can use. These are cold trust funds, I Correct. believe. Um, so is it fully subscribed or is there still room there for veteran um, mortgages? It is fully subscribed right now. It is revolving. So as we get those payments back in, um, we'll have those funds available for more lending. We um, get about 90, just straight amortization, we get about $90,000 back a month um, as, as loans pay off, you know, that revolves that a little bit faster. Um, but we, I don't anticipate doing more than two, three loans a year now going forward without a further allocation. And can you refresh my memory on the interest rate for those loans? Um, currently, the rate is at 3%. So it ends up being a point below um, the market rate or the board rate, whichever is lower. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any uh, more questions or comments uh, to Vicki about the uh, dashboard? Uh, any public comments or questions regarding the uh, overall home ownership program? Hearing none, thank you very much, Vicki. Thanks. We'll move on to uh, multifamily. Chairman, board members, um, the first item that we have on the agenda is um, <clears throat> the Billings Heights project, now known as um, Starner Gardens 4 in Billings. It's a tax exempt bond resolution reapproval. The, re the resolution for Starner Gardens was approved in November um, for $7 million and was amended to $11.5 million. Um, this was one of the ones that. Um, there was the push to try and get rolling um, when the municipal bonds were, where there was a danger of them going away at the end of the year. This resolution will replace the previous resolution and amendment. The new amount is 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 million. Bids are coming in higher than expected. The budget at this time re requires <clears throat> 15 million 600,000. MBOH and Bond Council suggest the amount should be 20 million to cover any overages. Excuse me. Um, staff has review, reviewed the proposal to raise the bond amount. Staff proposes the resolution be approved pending underwriting. That shouldn't say pending underwriting. We have the underwriting. Are there any questions, uh, discussion from members of the board? Mr. Chair, I want to go on the record as stating that I'm um, working on a very part-time basis for NeighborWorks Great Falls, and that agency is in a partnership with GMD Development, which is one of the partners in this deal. I intend to vote on this. I don't personally gain from the action, but I did want that on the record. Thank you. Are there any further comments or discussion from members of the board? Are there uh, comments or discussion from uh, members of the public? Greg is here. Is it on? Is this on? Yep. Um, yeah, maybe I'll come say a few words. I guess uh, you know, Sterner Gardens is. Oh, in, introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, uh, Greg Dunfield, GMD Development. Um, <laughs> the uh, Sterner Gardens is the second of two hybrid deals we've been working on in the state. Uh, utilizing both the 9% tax credit and 4% tax cent bonds. Um, during the gestation period of these deals, I mean, we've seen tax reform, which has reduced tax credit pricing, interest rates go up. Um, I mean, short term construction loan interest rates now are hovering around 5%, <laughs> which doubles that construction interest line item pretty quickly, considering just two years ago, year and a half ago, it was down around 3%, three and a quarter. Um, in addition, we bid both these projects out over the summer, and we definitely seeing ten dollar per square foot increase in just cost, um, just getting getting material cost and labor cost. And we've been, you know, doing a lot of restructuring to try and accommodate all those changes I just mentioned. Uh, this bond increase will give us the flexibility to leverage more into the 
the 4% tax and bond uh, project, and uh, we very much need it to continue moving forward with the project. Thanks. Thank you. Are there further comments uh, from members of the public? If there is no further discussion from members of the board, the chair would entertain a motion to approve uh, this resolution. So moved. Okay, been moved by Sheila and seconded by Jeanette uh, to approve resolution 180911MF05. All those in favor? Uh, just to clarify, I made the motion. Not oh, I'm Sheila. sorry. That's I'm okay. sorry, Amber. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, all those in favor of uh, Amber's motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, I vote aye on that last motion. Okay, the next um, agenda item is a loan request by Homeward um, for Ouellette Place in Lewistown. Um, <clears throat> Ouellette Place was a project that received funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, the ERA funds. Um, they received a loan from USDA that was at a higher rate and requires a very large amount of due diligence. This loan also, um, Homeward would like to, the loan <clears throat> in the amount of 300000 to to assist in the, with the payoff and prepayment penalty, closing costs, and appraisal and possible reimbursement to the operating reserves. Staff has reviewed the loan request and requests that the board consider and approve the loan request. This loan would be at 3.5%. Thank you, Mary. Uh, is there discussion or questions from members of the board? Mr. Chair, uh, Mary, wh where do we make these loans from? This would come from deallocated funds um, in our combined revenue account on the multifamily side. This is not a housing Montana trust fund. No, alone. no. So maybe can you just walk me through a little bit what that means? Whatever you just said, the combined revenue did that to that. I I think Bruce, it's kind of like the rest. Raspberry money, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly the same thing as the raspberry. You know, Mary has certain uh, mortgages uh, that are outstanding and bonds that are outstanding, and then she has certain monies on payments and payoffs and things that we have within the indenture. Um, and for projects that qualify, we're actually able to re loan that money and kind of revolve it. Um, there's a couple good things with that. Um, it's in the indentures, so it's protected, uh, but it also provides an income stream um, that's even better than investments. So, and we're using it for housing. So that's that's all a good thing. Well, Bruce or Mary, what would be the amount of funds available in that this particular pool? Um, you have that off the top of your head, right? Totally, it's three million million ish. Um, it but we can't necessarily use all of it. Um, the other side of this is that these funds are federally tainted um, so that we can't use them on a nine, regular 9% tax credit. Well, we can, but it's, it's a risk on a regular 9% tax credit deal. 
Thank you for the education of the board. <laughs> so some of that $3 million, if I'm right, is part of like debt service reserves and, and those types of things? This is Ginger from the Board of Housing, and yes, some of them are set aside for debt service reserve and uh, mortgage reserves. All right, thank you. Uh, further comments or questions from members of the board? Are there comments or questions from members of the public? Hi. Yes, Hi, I'm Ray Davis again. Homeward. Uh, not sure if you really have any questions for me, and I believe that there was likely material submitted in addition to this request, but um, I wanted to reemphasize our request to the Board of Housing um, was timely in that there were some funds available. We've been monitoring the financing of this loan for some years. Um, this is a rural development 538 loan. And on a, you know, I guess, you know, in, in, in line of just sharing information um, for information sake, this is a 24 unit property in Lewistown, Montana. And the interest rate that we pay on an annual basis is 7.75%. But the rural development 538 program allows for basically a, an interest rate reimbursement to the project. Unfortunately, we the project pays out that 7.75%, and at the end of the year, we're, we're able to receive a 2.5% reimbursement, but the effective interest rate is still 5.25% compared to the 3.5% that is permitted with this loan. In addition, the lender requirement, the lender themselves are more stringent than the HUD requirements that are actually associated. HUD has already has adopted some HUD uh, regulatory uh, uh, requirements, but the, the lender has um, basically imposed tr stricter requirements. So basically, we end up escrowing double the insurance payment because as a developer and owner, a owner prop uh, that owns properties all over the state, we aggregate our insurance, um, as you can imagine, our, our liability and property insurance. But we're required to escrow a separate insurance payment for this property because that is their underwriting requirements. So at the end of the year, we get that reimbursed, but what it does is it cash straps the property. And that's why we've had to actually uh, take from our operating reserve in order to cover some of the costs. So the cost of financing on this property has just um, somewhat undermined its ability to operate at, at peak performance. And so um, we'd been delaying in a request to you because we didn't really want to pay a prepayment penalty. There is a prepayment penalty every year. And in this case, we've basically reduced the amount of penalty that we have to pay by one year. And it's less than what it costs us for the cost of this existing financing. So for us, it was a real win-win. I just wanted to give that background. Thank you, Drea. Are there sure. questions of Drea? Are there further comments or questions from members of the public? If there's no further discussion from the board, the chair would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll move the motion to um, approve the proposal uh, of this loan as requested by the staff. Okay, Jeanette seconded. Uh, all those, if there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, chair aye. votes aye. Motion carries. If there's all four people voted eyes. Thank you. We're moving on to the uh, QAP, and the chair would like a like a five minute little recess. I agree before with the we... chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll take a five minute break, and I mean five minutes. <laughs>
Thank you all. We're going to move on to the qualified application plan. And um, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask for a main motion first to uh, and a second to approve the 2020 QAP as it was placed out for public comment. Um, there are, as we go through it, there are a couple things that have been inserted, but we will I'll let you know at the time. And <laughs> Uh, those items will have to be um, the subject of an amendment to the main motion. So at this point, I'm hoping Greg's ready to go here. One second. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg, for um, interfering. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to adopt the 2020 Qualified Application Plan as it was put out for public comment. Mr. Chair, I move that the board adopt the Qualified Application Plan. As Allocation, guys. Allocation plan, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I was the one that said application. Yeah. Allocation plan. I'm sorry. <laughs> overs. Overs, overs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, I, I propose that the board adopt the qualified allocation plan as presented by staff. Okay, is that uh, as uh, it was placed out for public comment? Correct. Correct. Do we have a second? Sure. Jeanette seconds. Okay, uh, we can now move through the proposed changes to the plan as it was put out. Move through uh, the plan, actually. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to comment that uh, the version of the QAP that's up on the screen um, started with the version as put out for public comment. Uh, there have been a few just technical corrections and so forth by, by staff and by myself. Um, there are a couple of additional changes uh, that came from discussions with staff and or the chairman, which I have highlighted and I will point out as we go through so that the board can decide on whether it wants to adopt those additional substantive changes. Yes, and I uh, had qualified that by saying that there were a couple changes that would have to be approved by amendments to the main motion. So I will page through here. If you see something you'd like to stop and focus on, please let me know. And of course, we'll insert all of the pertinent dates uh, once we get ready to submit this for governor's approval. There was some revision in the definition of applicable QAP. Um, which relates to the uh, credit refresh option that was adopted by the board recently. Um, this is just to make sure that when you're dealing with a particular issue or the amount or application of a fee or something like that, that the, the, the right year's QAP will apply to that particular item. So we, we needed, we in, in particular, uh, if there's a credit refresh when the project comes back for um, reservation, uh, carryover commitment, et cetera, the, the fees that are in the most recent QAP would apply to those processes rather than the QAP from some prior year when the project was initially awarded credits. 
as as Greg mentioned, as we go through here, uh, members of the board, if there's anything that you want to have discussion on, please uh, bring it up. And if you want to change anything, we'll have to have an amendment uh, to the main motion. And this goes for members of the public too. Uh, we may as well try to make this as uh, streamlined as we can. If you see something as we go through, please uh, ask to be heard and we'll listen to you at that time. Thank you. So uh, just a question, Greg, is this added from when we put it off for public comment or was uh, this included in? I think that was in there before, wasn't no, it, Greg? Uh, thanks, Bruce, for the clarification. No, this was this was in the QAP as proposed for public comment. And okay. So just technically, I mean, we're only going to talk about the additions that have been added after the fact, not the ones okay. that were already in there, right? I mean, or are we going to um, go through everything again? Well, we don't we don't need to go through each item if it's was included in the Q qualified al allocation plan that the public has reviewed, um, unless somebody wants specifically wants to bring that up. Okay, uh, thanks for that clarification. I'll uh, I'll move on to the um, items which were changed and that will obviously save us a lot of time um, uh, but again members of the public if you see if you want as we go through this if you get to a point where you want to talk about something please do so Greg on that small project right there um, I don't know how long that's been out there, but I caught it this time that that's the 24 or fewer, fewer units now is for only for purposes of the soft cost ratio. And that that's a clarification that we <coughs> did at this point after that was a change after the uh, public comment after it was released. Is that a technical change or is that something that the board should uh, consider and approve? It's a technical change. I just wanted to point it out. All right, thank you. Can we talk about that one? Yes, uh, I understand that we did have some comments regarding uh, the uh, limit on total project cost per unit. So if anybody, a member of the board or a member of the public at this time would like to talk about that, now is your opportunity. Pat, I would like to make a comment. Um, I'm struggling with this one. I think 235 is too high, personally, but that's where it is. So um, 240 is an average sales price of a home in Billings. So I really struggle to think that we can't keep units under an average sales price. Um, that, that doesn't say affordable to me. So this is one that I think we really need to consider what what we're trying to do here. Um, and so for me, 240, like I said, I think 235 is too high, but I think increasing it and just an arbitrary, you know, $5,000 added, you know, what's that $5,000? So I, I would just put that out there. Mr. Chairman and, and um, Mary, um, who requested it? How did that move to 240? Uh, Rationale. It, it came, <laughs> a lot of it was some of the discussion, discussion that happened at the QAP um, was um, heading towards very complicated processes for staff to go through to um, come up with the kind of breakdowns that they were requesting. Um, the 240 was 
really just the number that Bruce and I just said, okay, if you know, we're, we aren't we are going to fight this battle. Well, kind I of. Think- and we have, we, we need to have a number, whatever that number is, we need to have a number so that if Congress is looking at this and they see that number that we're not on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah, and I and we did we asked for more feedback that from from developers and really didn't get anything. No. Um, so we just we put a number that well it sounded okay, but you know I think from a staff perspective at least if if we revert to the two thirty five, yeah, I don't we think it would cause huge problems from the projects we've seen. But developers may have a, a comment on that too. Yeah, and what Mary, one more further question because I th- I think you kind of know the answer to this one is that average cost. What do we see in for our average cost of homes? So what did we come up with yesterday? So I looked that up. Um, so out of the 2018 applications, not just the funded, but all of them, the average cost per unit um, for all of them together was 202, 202,000. Uh, so I again looked at that for the 2019 letter of intent that were submitted, knowing that those were preliminary numbers, and that number had gone to 207,000 on an average. Okay, hey, is there further discussion? We don't have a motion to amend the main motion to change uh, the figure from 240 to any other number. So uh, if there isn't going to be a motion, we're going to move on. Heather? She's waiting for a mic. Uh, uh, Respectfully, this is a conversation that we have at every QAP discussion, and it's one we have at length because it is, at face value, that number seems uh, high. Um, As Amber indicated, uh, that if you're reading total project cost per unit and comparing it to a single-family home, we understand that. We've talked at length for several years at the QAP about the fact that we need we need a cap and we need something that is makes sense. But the, the, at the pace, the cost of construction materials are going up, labor going up. Uh, it was eight years we kept it at 235, mm-hmm. um, and or was it seven? 230. It's only it was 230. Right. For a long time. It's only been 235 for a couple of years. That's right. So there's just been minor, maybe unsubstantiated increases with that, not compared to market. And I say that because we feel like we should be talking about a cost per square foot or a credit per square foot or something that is measurable and can be compared against market data annually um, as it goes up. That doesn't preclude it getting too complicated in the communication or how it's laid out in the QAP or where the public sees it. But it's a struggle for projects that some projects have a land cost, some projects don't. Um, it's, I would, after doing small homes and what you heard about earlier, I wouldn't say single family is easier to do. It's actually more complicated. But on the multifamily side, there's costs associated with tax credit financing, uh, attorneys, uh, all kinds of components of costs that don't go into single family home development. And so comparing the 240 here to the 240 of a cost of home is not kind of apples and oranges. It's They're similar, but not quite the same. So it, we do have these lengthy conversations and um, it's not easy. And we, I think I'd recommend that we have a broader discussion between board and developers and staff about is there a way to capture it because just at face value you're right that's confusing but we do need to have uh, have a limit and literally the cost of steel doubling overnight this year and labor uh, shortages that's never not, not going to be a problem but it's been interesting with the tariff conversations um, as Greg alluded to cost per square foot going up ten dollars a square foot overnight is a challenge for us but you have to know the the whole equation to understand what that 240 means uh, and we've been staying in bounds but it's been it's been challenging it just depends on the project some projects are great because there's no land cost in them so it makes it a lot easier you can spend a lot more on construction so I, I, it's a bigger conversation than just um, random changes <coughs> and we have we we always talk about it for a couple hours every session so 
I agree it's still not right, and we need to figure out how to how to capture that. And there's and, and we've talked about looking at other states and how they do it. And I'm not sure anybody has the perfect bulletproof uh, QAP response uh, to the press, but um, there's different ways to assess those limits and keep us and make sure that we're using these um, important funds um, efficiently. Thank you, Heather. Um, is there a motion to? Um, I think we have another comment. Greg and Alex. Oh, I'm sorry, Greg. He's hiding behind me. Sorry. I'll, I just want to add Greg Dunfield, GMD. Um, I can certainly appreciate your comment, the board member's comment about average home costs. Uh, I think this metric, though, is really an outside cap. Um, I mean, with this QAP document, we're trying to create parameters. Um, so the 240 is not necessarily an average cost. It's, a, it's an outside cost. Um, it, we'd hate to see a project get tripped up because it slipped over 240 or 235 and wasn't able to move forward because of steel doubling in cost or something. So, I mean, it seems like a big number, um, but again, it's, this is an outside cost instead of a parameter rather than just an average or uh, you know a median cost. Just want to add that comment. Thank you, and I didn't mean to rush this. So, is there obviously there's further discussions <laughs> in the public? <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Alex Burkhalter from Housing Solutions. Alex, you have to hold it really close. Okay. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Alex Burkhalter from Housing Solutions. Um, I I appreciate um, Board Member Sunset's comment about that's the price of a single-family home in Billings. Um, when I stand before a city council proposing a project, this is always a very uncomfortable part of the conversation. Um, I... I think 235 or 240, I don't know if there's much difference there. Um, I appreciate that Montana does give us room to do projects. The states, Some of the states we deal in cost limits that are too low create real problems. Um, we drove through a neighboring state and looked at some of their projects and thought, why don't they have any windows? Well, they held their costs so long, so low for so long that it affected the product that was developed. Um, I don't see that happening in Montana. We've consistently had 15, 16, 17 letters of intent each year. Um, and I think the projects that get put on the ground are good projects and they're happening underneath this cost cap. We've seen costs go up without question, um, but I still think there's room in here to, to get it done. Um, you'll know this number is too low when you stop receiving applications or stop seeing windows. Thank you. Thank There's, you. Are there further comments from members of the public regarding this matter? What's your pleasure, board? I'm actually not going to make a motion. I just wanted to have the conversation publicly because I think this is something that we do need to look at. Um, and maybe it's not just a number on a page. Maybe it is a matrix. Maybe it is a formula. Um, but I do think that if we cannot keep costs down, and I know some of those are out of your control, but maybe it's not the right project, and we need to look at that. So I will not be making a motion, but I think the conversation needs to continue. Thank you, Amber. I think uh, I agree with you, but uh, and thank you for bringing it up. Mr. Chairman, may I too just make a comment? I'm not going to make a motion either. But I appreciate, uh, Heather, what, well, I appreciate totally what you said, and I think I get it. It's not apples. It's not oranges. But the general public doesn't know that. And so when you come before the city councils and such places that you need to go, it appears that we're really not being terribly transparent. And what I heard is that we're really just because we're going up five isn't really addressing what we really want to say. And um, so it feels like we're putting this, dis I, I, obviously we're going to put this discussion off. I'm not sure this benefits you totally in knowing where you have to go and who you have to co to, to, to get to understand uh, what you're saying. And so that's just my comments um, on it. The two, I, you know, Amber's not going to go anywhere with it and I'm not either for this amount, but I'm not sure it's the answer. Thank you. Are there further comments or questions regarding this particular item? If they're not, Greg, we can move on.
Members of the public, if you see anything as we go along here, be sure to uh, let us know that you would like to speak on it. Okay, we need to take a look at this. We adjusted these deadlines. Um, they're about a month earlier than, I mean, they end up being about a month earlier than they were, than they are this year instead of two months earlier. Was, was this so, an, was this, this is a change since they went out for public comment. So, um, it would be, um, the LOIs would be due the second Monday in April. Um, the presentations would be at the May 19 board meeting. Applications would be due the last Monday in July. And the award determination would be late October. Okay, are there any uh, comments or discussions from the board? Comments or discussion from members of the public? Okay, but we do need uh, an amended motion, uh, an, a motion to amend the main motion to adopt these these, these uh, deadlines. Yep. Mr. Chair, I move to amend the main motion by adopting the deadlines as shown on page 20. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. That's that's all of us. So move on, please. Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this section is, is an area where there are some changes uh, proposed since the QAP was sent out for public comment. Um, and this, this would uh, revise and clarify the requirements for requesting an increase in the amount of credits reserved uh, in terms of the supporting materials submitted and, and the board's determination and the factors to be considered. Okay, uh, board members, anybody have any comments or discussion regarding this proposed change? Uh, some, of, I believe some of the items uh, that are numbered there were in the original paragraph, were they not, Greg? That, that is correct. The, the list of factors um, were, were in there either explicitly or implicitly. Um, Except for uh, the, number the, num number three, I think is the is the significant new item, which was designed to uh, look at and consider, you know, what what other steps the applicant has <laughs> taken to mitigate any funding gaps or to find other sources to address those funding gaps, and 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 really the the idea that this is more of a last resort. Uh, uh, measure to address those funding gaps. All right. Thank you, Greg. Are there comments from the board regarding this proposed change? Okay, members of the public, have you had a chance to review this? And you haven't seen it before just now, but right. yeah, I please, please, please take a, no, a moment to that, review it. And if you have any comments, let us know.
Does anybody have, and uh, members of the public have any comments regarding this proposed language? Okay, the chair would entertain a motion uh, to adopt uh, these changes to the main motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, I make a motion to amend the main motion to adopt the language as uh, shown on the screen on page 23. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion from members of the board? Any discussion from members of the public? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion carries. I just wanted to point out there that I did make some clarifying changes. Um, I thought there was a little confusion as to when a mini market study was required to be submitted with a letter of intent. And um, that's, as I understand it, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, that's required only uh, for a competitive 9% correct letter of intent, but it is not required for a 4% letter of intent. So that that is a change. I, I don't think it's a substantive change. However, it's just a, it's really a clarification. Good. You asked my you answered my question. Um, this is more of the same clarification. We might. Did do any of you guys have comments on the income averaging? Are we okay? Uh, any member of there? the public have any uh, comments or questions regarding the uh, new language regarding income averaging? Uh, was this language in the? QAP as it went out to the public? Yeah, it was. They're just okay, but I will, some yeah, give them opportunity about it. to make yeah. it. Yeah. This is Kirk Brisker from the in regards to the income averaging. Will that be available for um, projects that already have a LIHTC reservation but haven't um, completed it, I suppose? So they would be of a it, when we're ready to deal with it, when we have the software in place and the requirements in place, um, it will be available. Um, you will be able to uh, basically come back and apply for it if you haven't done 8609s yet. Okay. Mary, I think you spoke yesterday about a deadline prior to the full occupancy. Um, we're considering that it would be that they need to um, come to us at least six months before lease up, and then we would try and get back to them within three months before lease up. Um, we realize that getting this in place and where some projects are that may not be doable on with this first round of projects that are already underway, but um, that's the concept for in the future. Any further questions or comments regarding income averaging? Hi, uh, Heather. Uh, Heather McMillan with Homeward. I just wanted to thank you guys for talking about it in more detail yesterday and considering and putting the placeholder we feel 
while it is more complex on one hand in certain markets on in certain projects, it makes great sense to extend that bandwidth. Uh, it might be the only solution solution in some communities, and we we often find people that make two hundred dollars too much or uh, you know just outside the bandwidth that are truly in need. So we know we're still working out the rules, but thank you for the consideration. We support it. Okay, Greg, we can move on. So right there, I just this is just clarification, but we changed this that <clears throat> it's quarterly reporting, and then broke out the status reports from the active projects to and the era reporting because it's a little different. So just clarification. We need to talk about that one. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we did propose some change in the section regarding the qualified contract process, and th this doesn't make any immediate substantive change, but we the, the board has now gone through one qualified contract process with, with one property and um, in the course of going through that process, I think we discovered a number of um, areas where the process document, um, I apologize, where the process document uh, could use some improvement, uh, a few items that, that weren't addressed fully or you know need to be clarified. So um, in speaking with staff, we do contemplate proposing some changes in that regard, but we wanted to kind of decouple it from the QAP so that to do that, we could do it, you know, some on some other time schedule and not have to wait for the QAP. So what this really does is it keeps in place the current qualified contract process document until and unless the board were to propose a revised process document through the administrative rules process at which time any such process adopted that way would supersede and replace the current one. So in adopting a, it through the administrative rules process, there'd be an ample opportunity for comment by anybody interested. Yeah, yes, it would go through the regular uh, notice of public hearing with an opportunity for comment at the hearing or, or in writing. So this is more a process uh, Type provision. Yeah, it 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 kind of just gives us a way to step this out of the QAP into a separate rule um, and not have to do it as part of the QAP process at that exact same time. Members of the developer community, have you had an opportunity to read that? Do you have any comments? Fifty-five, fifty-five, and fifty-six. And I, the, the stuff on 56 is just kind of crossing out the prior uh, language. Now, this is new language that we, we need a uh, an amendment. Yes, that's amendment correct. motion to the main motion. Mr. Chair, I move to amend the main motion to adopt the language shown on the screen in page 55 and 56. 
Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, and been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion, questions from the board regarding this proposed language? Any comments or questions from members of the public? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, let the record show that Johnny is back and so I don't need to vote. <laughs> uh, Post same sign, hearing none, motion carries. I believe that that was the last of the items. And so I want to then bring us back to the public comment that was submitted by several developers and then a comment that was submitted by um, Homeward about the comment. Well, was, rather than refer to their written comments, I think they're here. So if if there yeah. is, uh, I just want I to make sure I was going to give the public an opportunity to, to address the main motion and any other things that they okay. wanted to do. So this may be the, the time to do that. If we have com gone through the uh, draft QAP for 2020 um, and we have members of the developer community here who would like to address the uh, proposed QAP in general or in any particular, uh, now is your opportunity. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Alex Burkhalter from Housing Solutions. Uh, we, with, along with several other developers, submitted a comment as related to uh, Section 3, which deals with um, eligible applicants. Uh, and as you probably read, the, the idea behind it was um, we seem to have noticed a pattern of jobs that are being delayed or it's a long amount of time from award to uh, when they start construction or are placed in service, and just looking for a mechanism to hold uh, awardees accountable to keep moving, um, as well as you know incentivize folks to to keep going. Um, I'm not sure if that's the 100% bulletproof solution to that problem, but um, just something we wanted to see. We've noticed in other surrounding states they do look at what um, development team members currently have underway and um, how those jobs are moving forward or or not. Um, and so just thought some language uh, along those lines could be relevant in our QAP. Uh, Heather McMillan with Homeward. Uh, we wanted to uh, just go on the record and actually support the concept. Um, it does need to be discussed because we also have concerns about projects actually progressing at a reasonable pace and always the capacity check and it behooves the Board of Housing to understand where projects are and that they are moving forward uh, and if they're not for various reasons they need, you should be aware and it should be in your status updates or the quarterly reports at, at a minimum. Uh, there's language in the QAP that require us to report back to you but I'm not sure you're getting all the information that you need to understand where projects are. Uh, we did have some concerns and apologize our um, communication for the submission that Alex put in um, was right at Labor Day and so we didn't get a chance to discuss and kind of come in as a collective but um, we would recommend that you guys consider some of these um, milestones, maybe not based on placed in service. Uh, other states do other milestones. Um, uh, closing or start of construction. There's some other things you can measure, but also um, credit limits uh, so that you aren't giving all your credits to multiple one developer instead of it being two projects where there might be a partial uh, partnership uh, on one and a full uh, role on another. Um, it's just, it's a little too simple, but I don't want to overcomplicate it, but we do, I think it warrants a discussion and maybe not for today, but for um, next year's uh, QAP or um, we could talk about it today as well, but you guys should have, be able to hold us accountable and we should be able to respond. Um, generally support that. Are there any other 
public comments that you submitted or you want to make now? Greg Dunfield, GMD Development. Um, I think certainly the concept that uh, sponsors should be held accountable to uh, timelines that, as they're put forth with certain projects. Um, I would also ask that any policy that is developed has flexibility um, with the fact that, uh, you know, different projects have different timelines. Um, most of our, a lot of our recent projects, I'm realizing actually involved, uh, you know, annexations into the city, uh, new final plat maps, which we're not able to really start that kind of work until we get a confirmation of funding. Those processes are, are really very long in a lot of places. Um, and so I think just to make sure that the, any policy that's developed distinguishes between, you know, changes to original timelines versus just long timelines. Because <laughs> sometimes I think these projects do require long timelines and uh, I appreciate the flexibility. That's all. Further comments? Are there any other comments regarding any item in the proposed uh, QAP other than the eligible applicant section? Hearing no uh, additional comments, is there further questions, comments, discussion from members of the board? Hearing none, uh, I'm going to ask for a vote on the main motion as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. That's four votes in favor. All those, <laughs> anyone, anyone opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is a good opportunity uh, maybe to have a break so that people can check out before 11 if they haven't already checked out. Okay, there we go. We'll take a 10 minute break.
only have to reach your endurance and begin to chat. Yeah. 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 You are not really kidding me. <laughs> you realize I'm, like, I'm a, the rule follower, right? I am like totally. Yeah, I know. You need to go on a road trip with her because I would be the one to fly. I just have a um, couple items on the update. In your board packet, um, there's an article about the meadows that you funded um, the rehab in Lewistown. And also, um, Bruce and Greg can explain a little bit maybe, but there were, I don't know how many of you were aware um, that there was some um, panic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, over a decision that was starting to come out of the Department of Revenue um, saying that these tax credit projects weren't eligible for the property tax exemption. On Thursday, a letter was re, uh, released by the Department of Revenue that said that they are going back to their original interpretation of that rule. Um, so we're all kind of okay at the point. Did you want to talk about that at all, or do you guys want any more information about that, or we're good? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mary. Yeah, right. You, you uh, explained that yesterday quite thoroughly, so okay. we appreciate it. Thank right. you. Thanks. But we also understand the issues aren't necessarily over either. There's other things that come up down the line, too. So. Well, I see that next in my book is servicing, but next on the microphone is Ginger. So we'll have finance. Oh, we're, you're, you're going to do it from right there. Okay. Oh, sorry, Ginger. No. Okay. You're on the social. This is Mary, Montana Board of Housing Mortgage Servicing Program Manager. Um, I will just go over our stats pretty briefly here. Um, this month in July, we have 4,846 loans that we have been servicing. Um, the majority of those loans are Board of Housing, and we do have about 200, 298 Board of Investment loans and 16 multifamily loans. 
Principal balance is $444.7 million with uh, 4.3 or 4.4 million is the escrow funds. And then also about 687,000 of lost draft. Um, as far as loans that are delinquent over 60 days past due, 148 loans are over 60 days past due. The actual foreclosure sales that we did have in July were two. And um, total calendar year, we've had 19 foreclosures. Um, our delinquent contact calls to make are usually calls that are loans that are 17 to 21 days past due. And then also once they reach 60 days past due, we reach out monthly. Um, that was 721 um, contacts to make this this month. And late fees uh, went up a little bit. Uh, income was about $21.9 thousand dollars, and we have 51 payoffs and 79 new loans. So that's that's a good sign is that we have more new loans than they're paying off. Um, active financial packets means we have two borrowers that are in a um, temporary hardship, and we are looking at their financial packet to see what type of loss mitigation they qualify for. Uh, such as our repayment plans or forbearances. Um, those are in writing. We have plans with our borrowers and they're 23 right now. And uh, we have a HAMP partial claim mod pending as well, just one. And for our preservation properties, uh, we have about eight, we have eight properties that we're preserving until we convey back to the insurer, uh, such as FHA or RD, and then or the borrower has abandoned the property and we're taking we're making sure we preserve it. We have two REO properties that we do own and are selling. Um, and then Chapter 13 bankruptcies, they seem to stay pretty steady. We have 21. And uh, we do remain a uh, Tier 1 with HUD. And I believe we just got the update for the second quarter for 2018. Uh, and it's also uh, A rate. So that's all I have today. Do you have any questions? Great job, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Mary regarding servicing? Any questions or comments from members of the public? Uh, Ginger, you're up. Uh, Ginger Fancook, the accounting manager, Montana Board of Housing. Um, the accounting department is currently working on the financial statements for fiscal year 18, which ended on June 30th, 2018. We're using a new program this year and that's going very well. Um, the dashboard is showing the first section, the uh, diversification, and as you can see, we still have the majority of our uh, funds in money market. The money market accounts are earning so much more than they were last year at this time that uh, that's not as uh, disappointing as it has been in the past. We are having some difficulties getting uh, investments that exceed the uh, income of those money markets, but I am seeing some increases. And um, at the bottom of the page there, if you look at the, uh, or the next section down, the weighted average trend, you can see that it did actually go higher than it has in the last several months in June, and um, I just looked at July's numbers, and they're about the same as they were in the June numbers. So it is holding steady. We are doing most of our investments on the shorter-term basis to uh, kind of hedge against the, the volatility of the um, market as it goes up and down right now. I really don't want to see go out too far um, with our investments, not knowing where we're going with them right now. Um, the maturity, as it's shown on the bottom, like I said, a lot of those uh, maturities are shorter term than they were. We still have several in the 11 to 25 thousand dollar, excuse me, 11 to 25 year range, and most of those have been on the books for. Uh, 
a length of time. Uh, those aren't recent investments. Most of the investments that we've made are actually in the last couple of years are actually the ones that mature in the uh, available now to the one to five period of time. Um, it's just been a safer investment, uh, like I said, with the volatility of the market. And that's actually all I have. Well, thank you, Ginger. Are there any comments or questions of Ginger from members of the board? Are there any public comments or questions from members of the public? Thank you, Ginger. That will conclude the finance program update. Operations Executive Director. So um, just a reminder that um, there's no board meeting in October, but we will have a board meeting in November. That will be the uh, meeting that we award the allocations of housing credits. So an important one, we have hotel rooms for you the night of the 18th. So we'll start that meeting the morning of the 19th, I believe at 8.30, uh, I'm pretty sure we started, yeah, that's right, at 8.30. So uh, having everyone there would be very much appreciated. Uh, just operational updates. Uh, we've had a few staff that have made moves, um, positive moves. Um, Jason Krebs from the admin team has moved up to Section 8. Um, they also have Mikhail Holmes, who's left her position. Uh, Becky Shaw retired from project-based Section 8. Um, and both of these uh, positions have been posted. So um, we are also post have posted Jason Krebs, so we should be looking to hire his replacement soon. Uh, in servicing, Aaron Barton was a successful applicant for the foreclosure program specialist um, that was vacated by Lisa Huff, who had passed earlier this year. Uh, Amy Adams was a candidate chosen to fill Aaron's position, so we're kind of moving chairs around a little bit. Um, and then Amanda Hendrick was hired for Amy's position. Ryan Baker moved to multifamily with Mary. Um, and by Lindsay, yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, Carl O'Loughlin was also hired as part-time preservation program specialist. And finally, Lois moved over to the director's office in management services, so we were really sad to see her go, but we're, we're higher in that position also. So that's really kind of the updates. Um, I don't think I have anything else unless staff, is there any final thoughts on stuff? I do know that we are going to adjourn the meeting now, shut off the recording. We'll keep the webinar and phone call going. And then um, CAP um, is here, and we'll have a discussion about 49% projects. Mary? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll just say it. Um, so um, yesterday, um, the servicing team was nominated for the governor's award um, and was recognized at, the, at a commerce event yesterday morning, as well as Ryan, Ryan Culver um, for the work that he um, has done in multifamily, um, you know, setting up some of their systems. And it was it mainly around the... Um, the UPCS software. So, so those those guys were all recognized. And and Mary. Oh, well, I see. I did not even know that Mary was uh, Alfred. <laughs> thanks for telling me. Uh, <laughs> Mary was nominated as. Um, because there was a team that worked on the Opportunity Zone project in the departments, and Mary was part of that. So congratulations, Mary. All right. Um, I think that's it. Anything else? All right. Anything from any member of the public before we adjourn? None. Okay. The meeting is adjourned. All right. So, Kat, if you want to come.